Imagine yourself scrolling through social media and finding a scientific topic that catches your attention. Maybe it's the highly controversial nuclear energy. The federal government wants Canada to be a world leader in developing SMR. This evidence represents a very strong case, in my opinion, that the greenhouse effect has been detected and it is changing our climate now. Nuclear power plants only emit 12 grams of carbon dioxide, enough to fill about three two-liter soda bottles. Scientific information can be very confusing, not only to the average person, but to experts as well. Take for example the current pandemic, a widely debated issue that has generated disagreement in many topics. There's been significant disagreements about issues such as how the virus passes between us, how many of us are immune, the wisdom of mass testing, how well masks work, whether we can eliminate the virus, and that question about the closure of schools to stop the spread. In this video, we will take a look at examples of public mistrust in several scientific topics and explore some of the aspects regarding public concern, including the lack of scientific consensus as well as the lack of public trust for scientific claims. Whose responsibility is it to circumvent mistrust in science? There is currently a problematic relationship between expert knowledge and the public knowledge, which typically emerges in everyday life as a part of particular issues. In, in science, you know where you are now, you know what the evidence is now, but we learn and you need to, you need to change your approach as you go through. So there's always a level of uncertainty. And some people think that we have the answers to people's disease. And one of the important things I say to the patient quite often is, is I don't know. The debate over civil nuclear power is often presented by the nuclear industry and government agencies as a division between nuclear experts and an emotional public. Accordingly, public education is seen as the best way to win over support. If only people knew the facts, then they would not needlessly worry, right? Turns out, it's not that simple. This commitment to educating the public is not just limited to the pro-nuclear lobby. Environmentalist groups are also keen to disseminate the real facts about nuclear power. On each side, technical arguments are central to the debate. Meanwhile, the public are confronted with conflicting technical assessments of nuclear risk offered by groups who each claim a special understanding of the facts. In each case also, these technical assessments represent an important part of the attempt to win over public opinion to a particular stance on the nuclear issue. A similar analysis can be made of the 1990 debate over what became known as mad cow disease, but known in scientific discussions as BSC, bovine spongiform encephalopathy. Statements from the British Department of Health and also from distinguished figures, such as Professor Sir Richard Southwood, informed the public that the risks of BSC were tiny. As Sir Richard argued, we have more reason to be concerned about being struck by lightning than catching BSC from eating beef and other products from cattle. Meanwhile, public concern was still high, as indicated by the sudden drop in meat sales accompanied by its steep rise in media attention. Despite the official statements on BSC and the claims that scientific evidence suggested the risks to be small. So the question is, why is there mistrust in science? First, as with the nuclear issue, Scientific opinion was by no means unanimous. Second, scientists do not automatically command public trust. In addition, in attempting to identify and fill knowledge gaps of the general public, an unhealthy power relationship for a dominant and all-knowing science and a subservient public is created. If the public wants to be proper participating citizens, then it must attain a certain level of scientific literacy. In order to realize itself as proper participating citizens, the public must become knowledgeable. The distortion of the public view of modern science has led to little or no consideration of whether they imply anything might be wrong with the organization, control, and conduct of science, in addition to just its communication. It is taken for granted that the source of the problem lies not with the inability of scientists to communicate their knowledge, but mainly with the inability of the public body to assimilate it. Therein lie the fundamental issues. The public body is assumed to be an aggregate of individuals with the same social structure, 
knowledge base, and opportunities for knowledge, whereas many differences and boundaries to these exist in society. It is also assumed that the public's values are identical to those of sciences, where these differences also exist in today's society. In my opinion, uh, what we've seen so far, I don't think represents a substantial threat to human health in the United States. And I don't think it's really a threat to animal health. I do think that we have serious economic and political concerns about this, but I think some of the responses that are purporting to protect public health are going to have a net detrimental effect on food safety in the United States because they will detract from our measures that are meant to control diseases that are killing people in the United States. And uh, I don't expect to live to see anybody die of variant CJD here. Although these are relevant problems, they aren't the everyday issues the general public worries about. My parents who live in Florida know a young woman who died in Virginia. She's about my age, and she died from variant CJD. Um, she had traveled in Europe, so it's not clear where she contracted it. But once you know someone who's died from the disease, I don't think you can be um, as offhand about it as I used to be. And as a mother of three children, I'm still trying to engage in some sort of intelligent risk assessment, which I agree with the panel members is difficult. But for instance, I read in the newspaper a few weeks ago that uh, animal scientists, one was from Berkeley and I think San Diego, were suggesting that if contaminated food meal were fed to even um, pork or chicken, that it could be transmissible that way. And Although it's easy, in a sense, to count the deaths from COVID and count the hospitalizations. We should be always trying to measure the what else is going on in society in terms of mental health, in terms of, you know, again, life satisfaction, in terms of fa abuse, family breakup, and so on. So what have we learned from these examples of mistrust in science? We need to recognize that demystifying science is as much of a responsibility for experts as it is for the public and that scientific institutions need to recognize the limitations of scientific forms of understanding and rather explore contextual knowledge that may be better understood by the public.